My name is Brett Waymark. I'm the music director of the Sydney Philharmonia Choirs, and I'll be conducting our concert at the Sydney Opera House this Easter, which will be Bach's extraordinary piece, the B minor mass. So Easter this year, we're doing B minor mass by Bach, which is a piece that he well, sort of put together at the very end of his life. Uh, so at the end of Bach's life, he was sort of compiling, if you like, encyclopedic versions of the art of the fugue, the musical offering, the Goldberg variations, to which, it, the, the, as if he was saying, this is the greatest possible expression you can get out of these forms. Uh, but there are two pieces of music that I could listen to every day for the rest of my life. One of them is the Monteverdi Vespers, and the other is this piece, the Bach B minor mass. And at the moment, I am listening to it every single day of my life. Uh, and it's interesting, both pieces were written by composers applying for a job. So Monteverdi was applying for the job at, uh, in Venice, um, at St. Marco. And at the end of his life in Leipzig, Bach was still fighting with you know, the, the powers that be, the authorities in Leipzig. They just didn't realize the genius they had in their midst. Uh, he saw an opportunity in Dresden, which had become a largely Catholic court. Um, so really, in many ways, the first couple of movements of this piece were sent to the Dresden court with the hope that it would be the piece that opened the new Hofkirche there as well. Uh, so again, there was sort of a job application, you know, this is what I could do for you. Uh, and then we don't really know why Bach composed this piece. Uh, it wasn't performed in its entirety in his lifetime. It was actually, it waited over 100 years. It wasn't until 1859 that Zelta actually performed it in Leipzig, which is, you know, was Bach's home for the best part of his life. Uh, and then when the church opened two years after Bach's death, it was actually a different mass that opened the church. So it's a piece that's a bit shrouded in, in mystery, in a sense, but it is, it is the biggest work that he ever conceived. Um, and it contains work that goes right back to 1740 in some of his happiest years at Curtin and that it, composed, it has some of this music that is freshly composed, what, one or two years before um, he went completely blind and died in 1750. So, I mean, for me, a day where you don't listen to Bach is not a day you know, where I feel like I've achieved something. And you know, many composers will start their day playing Bach or singing Bach as a, almost like a, a detox from modern life, in a sense. Bach, unfortunately, had said it all. I remember being at a master class in America with the famous American um, choral conductor, Robert Shaw. And he actually stopped the rehearsal at one point and just said, you know, because of this one page of Bach, Wagner never needed to happen um, because it's all, it was already written here in, in 1749 or whenever he, he wrote it. It's also a deeply personal piece for me. Uh, it's a piece that I performed the tenor solo in, uh, in Sydney. It's a piece I've sung in. Uh, the very first year that I was here as assistant chorus master back in the 1740s. Uh, uh, it was the first piece that the choir was working on that I came in on as assistant chorus master. And now it's the fourth time that I've worked on the piece. And it's the first time that I feel that I'm actually even remotely starting to really understand just how deep it is. It's, it's one of those, it's a bit like a musical iceberg. You see only the bit that's up the top, but there's so much that's underneath uh, that went into this composition. And again, you constantly ask yourself, why did Bach write this? In the Lutheran tradition, all they would do is a Kyrie and a Gloria. So why did he, at the very end of his life, decide that I'm going to write a Missa Torta, a complete Catholic Mass? Partly it was for Dresden, um, a, a, you know, hopefully a get-out-of-jail card from Leipzig, uh, to a court which had some of the most splendid singers in, in Germany there, um, including Faustina, who one of the arias was actually written for. But again, it's, it's one of those pieces where the sacred and the secular are not, are not separate things in Bach's world. Triumphant music is always triumphant. Mor sornful, uh, sorrowful, mournful music is always sad in the same, in the same way. So to me, it's, it's a deeply religious piece, but it's a deeply human piece as well. And as somebody who you know, is constantly questioning all of those things, it speaks to me first and foremost as a, as a musician talking to another musician. Uh, 
And so for me, it, it, that, that is why I could listen to it for, for the rest of my life, every single day. And I said to the choir at the very first rehearsal, if there was one piece you'd want to be stuck on a desert island with, it'd be this piece, because you'd never get to the bottom of its resources and its richness. We're doing it in the Sydney Opera House, which is a glorious venue. We've uh, gathered together some of Australia's best Baroque soloists to do it. Uh, we're performing it on modern instruments, but we actually will still maintain the flavour that Bach would have conceived. Uh, we're using period trumpets, so it'll, it'll sound like the sort of trumpets that Bach was accustomed to. It has a corno di caccia, which is essentially this massive hunting horn, which is used in only one movement, and why he chose a hunting horn for that particular um, movement, we really don't know. In fact, we actually think it might have been written for trumpet and oboes, and then one of his students just got the transposition wrong and it was written for bassoons and corno di caccio instead, so we, we really don't know. Uh, if you want to hear a piece that really shows what Bach did throughout the course of his entire compositional life, um, this is the one. It's got, like I said, pieces from a very early stage right to the, possibly the very last thing he wrote, the, the beginning of the credo. Um, but the other thing is as well, regardless of whether, you, whether you're you know, a Christian or you don't believe in, in this particular ritual that we go through at Easter, like I said, there is something deeply human about this music, um, and it is, it is a score of great contrast. So, you know, one moment you've got trumpets heralding the, the opening of heaven, and the next we're in the lowest possible pit of despair. Um, and so, I mean, it, just, it, it, is a, it is a true journey, I think, in many ways. Um, and Bach is very much in control of the, of the ship at every step of the course. The very opening, uh, which the, the text is Lord Have Mercy, uh, was written in 1733. It was written during an official period of mourning in Prussia. Uh, it was originally in C minor, which is a very dark key. And then when this job came up at Dresden, he retook that music, but he actually cast it in B minor, um, in a much darker, also ominous key. So it starts from a sense where it's almost like a funeral rite, in a sense, but then what he does is he takes you through what feels like the normal path of a Catholic Mass. But remember he's writing for a largely Lutheran audience, or we think he might have been. Maybe he was writing for a Catholic audience, we don't know. But what he does very carefully is right is exactly halfway through your journey, just imagine being on a pilgrimage, at the halfway point where you're exhausted. He brings possibly the most poignant music, which is the Crucifixus. And for the first time in the piece, he repeats the text over and over over again, as if to say, remember, this is the central tenet of our belief system. And then the minute that finishes, he goes into the et resurrexit, which is the vision of the other possibility there. And it is possibly the most glorious, most luminous, most dance-like uh, music there. So again, it is, a, it, is, I, it is actually like doing one of those pilgrimages where you, some days you can go for days and not see a single soul and then the very next day turn a corner and you are overwhelmed by some of the most beautiful architecture, art, music, people, um, experiences. So it's that sort of journey that this piece takes you on and the fact that it is long, I mean it's about 80 minutes of music um, and as I said, it never stays in one place for long. In fact, the longest movement is actually the setup, the, the opening Kyrie. Uh, but it takes you on such a profound journey that I, you know, I doubt that anyone would not be moved by it. And the, and the thing that really speaks to us, I think, with this piece is halfway through, he has a piece which is Grazia, so we, we thank the Lord for this extraordinary creation. But at the end, he uses exactly the same music, and it's a Dona Nobis Pacem, which just means grant us peace. And I think, whether you're a Christian or not, I can't imagine a, a better message for the world at this particular point in time. Uh, so even, even the thought of it almost makes me sort of well up. Um, for me, that's, that's the journey, that where we start, where we feel we're almost at the, the, the graveside of somebody. We go through this extraordinary journey we, where we capture glimpses of heaven, but then we're always pulled down to remember the deep sorrow that's the condition of being human as well. Um, but we end with this almost universal hope for mankind, personkind, of peace in our time. Um, and I think Bach 
knew that he was also writing for the religious turmoil that was in his own country. I mean, it wasn't Germany. It was a Holy Roman Empire. That period, Germany wasn't unified. And it was a bloody time that he lived in. Every, every day walking to his church, he would have seen executions in the, in the town square. So, and war was always at the, at just, in, just festering in the background. Um, so again, I think there's something about this piece that transcends that gap of, what, 250 years between Bach's time and ours, and why we come back to it all the time. Because at the end of the day, we go on this journey, and the essential message of the piece is, grant us peace. You know, I came to Bach quite late, actually. I, I came to Baroque music very much via Handel. I always found Bach extremely difficult, um, partly the language, because it's in German. And, you know, Bach's music can be very mathematical. But again, by the end of his life, he had, he had sort of transcended the, the difficulty of it. So all the mathematics is there. It's like what I said before. It's like a, an iceberg. All the mathematics is underwater, and all you see is this beautiful crystalline music, which is just perfectly formed at the top. Um, but I remember hearing the Gloria of this piece in a Christmas concert. Um, and again, it's interesting because the Gloria is related to the birth of Christ and the nativity and things like that. So I heard that and I just thought it was the most celebratory music I'd ever heard. You know, three trumpets, timpani, a full orchestra, a chorus singing faster than is humanly possible. Um, it just, it, there's something about the excitement of, of the message of that text, which also finishes with, and peace on earth and goodwill to men, where he, he literally has a bass and all the instruments are just slowly working their way up. Um, you know, so that the imagery and, and the meaning in the music is just so profound. But it was, it was the Gloria in the B minor mass that, that I actually think sort of got me into Bach's music, I think, in some ways.